You're supposed to associate me not with the nun, but with the girl holding the hurley. <laughs> Which I did really play. Um, so I, I did go to a convent school. I did wear a school uniform that looked identical to these. And I was taught by a bunch of very strong women uh, nuns who taught us two very important life lessons, which we did not appreciate at the time. The first was that, it was an all-girls school, I should add. Uh, the first one was that, as a woman, you can do anything you like. You want to be a surgeon, you'll be a surgeon. You want to be an engineer, oh, we better teach you advanced mathematics, which we didn't do before. Um, and the second rule that they taught us was that it's okay to go against the flow. Um, that's, that's the rule I'm using right now, <laughs> to not talk to you about functional programming. Um, and we did not appreciate this at the time, I have to say, me and my classmates. Um, we never thanked these women for the great education they gave us and the great preparation for the rest of our lives. We all went off to university and had a good time and were delighted to meet boys. Um, so I, I went to Trinity College Dublin. This, uh, okay. <laughs> This is a photograph of Trinity College Dublin, which you might want to look at later when my slides become available. It's mind-boggling. Uh, John and I got married in that church there um, later. But I studied electronic engineering, uh, two years of general engineering science, and then two years of uh, specializing towards really computer science and electronics. <coughs> Pardon me. And we were 10 girls in the first year of 120. And we were 10 girls, the same 10 girls, in the final year out of 80. And we supported each other, um, we, and we had a good time. I used uh, non-law number two at the end of my studies to study theoretical computer science instead of instrumentation and control. So I did theoretical computer science and electronics together. This was never heard of before, and probably never has been since. And I've been living on that combination ever since. And, and in, in my final year, because of that, I, I met formal methods. I was taught formal methods by somebody who later was a colleague in Glasgow called Joe Morris. And he kind of noticed me in the class. Actually, in the first lesson, he, he told us, we're, we're going to learn about writing programs and proving them correct, so we're not going to run any of them. Um, we're just going to write them on paper, Dijkstra style. So he said, OK. In the first lecture, I'm going to ask you to write a program. And if you fail to write this program, I will not let you take the course. <laughs> and I failed. So he was very happy with me because I wrote nothing. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't solve the problem, but at least I knew not to write nonsense. Right? So I was allowed to take the course anyway. <laughs> and he started to show me papers and give me his thesis to read that he was writing at the time. And I went off to Oxford then, at his insistence really, to study formal methods, uh, a master's degree in formal methods. So this is my favorite picture of my career. Um, can you spot me? <laughs> um, <clears throat> this, is, this is the kind of end of year picture of the master's course in Oxford that we took in 1981. Uh, Tony Hoare's in the middle. He looks exactly the same now, right? <laughs> presiding quietly over everything, right? We were eight students. I was the one woman. Uh, and there were, in this picture, there are six, eight students and six teachers. And, you know, and, the, and the teachers include people like, you know, Abri Allen Suffren, who were inventing Z, the specification language, before our very eyes. It was just a fantastic year. And just before the end of it, Tony asked me if I would like to do a doctorate, which I had not given the slightest thought to. But I said, yes, why, why not? Uh, and, and that was it. I didn't think at all about gender at this time. Uh, I was probably blissfully unaware that I was the only woman in the class. Um, and I thought everything was going to fix itself. Right? I thought, oh, well, there's only eight of us, so it's OK that there's only one woman. Small numbers, you know, soon it'll get better. <coughs> but here's working group 2.8, uh, 35 years later in Edinburgh. Uh, you probably recognize some of the people in this picture. You know, there's Simon Peyton Jones, Phil Wadler, John is over there somewhere, and so on. But it's about 10% women still, right? So not much has changed in those 35 years, and I thought everything was going to fix itself. Um, if you look at 
my own, the, the Swedish universities, I, I'm a full professor, I should say, at, uh, in Chalmers. Uh, if you look at the Swedish universities, the, the, these, these two different charts from 2016 and 2018 show the percentage of female full professors at the 15 biggest Swedish universities. Um, so teal is the women and purple is the men. Um, at the bottom of the list, you have the technical universities. Surprise, surprise, okay. Uh, and at the very bottom of the list, you have Chalmers. Um, and I feel this in my everyday work, right? Uh, we, in, in 2016, we had 14% female professors in Chalmers. Doesn't sound too bad, except that there are some departments that have 30. So there are other departments that have almost none. In fact, for a long time, I was the only female professor. We gained another one last week. Uh, and she's in, indeed also going to be head of department. But having graphs like this is very useful if you want to make change, because presidents of universities don't like to be at the bottom of tables. Right? And just above Chalmers is KTH, the Royal uh, Institute of Technology, our arch, our arch rival, and they keep beating us. You know, no matter how we improve, they improve a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> if you look at academic staff, and not just full professors, for the different disciplines that are kind of officially studied in Sweden, Again, now this is numbers instead of percentages, but it, you see that clinical medicine is the largest discipline in Sweden, in ac academia, and it's about 50-50, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, computer science is actually quite large, data och informationsvetenskap, which I've uh, circled there, but it's got hardly any women, academic staff. And electronics, uh, uh, electrical and electronic engineering has, is about half the size of computer science and has an even worse uh, percentage of uh, um, academic staff. So my two beloved topics are kind of dismally poor when you compare them with every other topic in Sweden. Physics is nearly as bad, but at Chalmers at least it's slightly better. I think, yes. So you might think, okay, is it possible to just ignore this problem? And I, I actually, I have been working at Chalmers for some ridiculous number of years and ignoring the problem, okay, until about two years ago when I realized that the percentage of female students entering our computer science and engineering, uh, engineering program, the one where they learn, uh, you know, they do Haskell in their first programming course, that one, the good one, 7% females entered in 2016. I mean, this just is mind-boggling. It's, so it's, it's fun, you can get good jobs when you do it, you know, uh, why, why don't we have more females? And when you have a, as low a number as seven, you risk losing these students just because they feel to be too much in the minority. So you might think, and this is Sweden. You know, Sweden tops the rankings of all this gender equality stuff. You know, it's officially the most gender equal country in the world in one of the latest rankings. And still we have this kind of number in computer science. And we need to do something about it. So one of my aims with this talk is to convince you that we collectively as a community need to worry about figures like this and do something about it. And you might think, okay, <coughs> pardon me, uh, is it just as bad in other countries? Uh, yes. I think the answer is a resounding yes. Um, here are the different topics of study in the UK. Um, the numbers are for 2016, I believe, but it's from a report from 2018. Uh, it shows female undergraduates, female postgraduates as percentages, and then male undergraduates and male postgraduates in the different colors. What is at the bottom? We're there, we're there at the bottom again in the UK. Um, and if you draw a chart for the whole of Europe, in fact, this is from Informatics Europe. So I think there's 15 or 16 countries, not including Sweden, uh, represented here. Uh, this chart has 50% at the top. So we would like this to be just full of bars. It's two types of universities, I think research universities and more uh, technical, um, uh, apprentice style training and so on. 
Um, over on the right-hand side, you've got the UK, 15%. Okay. Uh, Belgium looks pretty terrible, about six, five or six percent here. There are three countries that stick out, and it would be interesting to know why. And so they're, they're at least much better than the others, and that's uh, Bulgaria, Estonia, and Romania. It would be interesting to, speak, to find out if we have people, for example, from these countries, why that is the case. They're at least uh, educating more females in computer science than the other countries. Now, about two years ago, <coughs> uh, Chalmers, which is a private university, asked its staff, what would you like to change about Chalmers? We have money. If you think of a good idea, <laughs> we will give you money. Um, and having you know, seen these kind of, uh, the 7% really was the thing that got me, I thought to myself, okay, if I write a grant proposal that says we will make Chalmers more gender balanced in the next 10 years, they will give me the money. And it took 18 more months between thinking that thought and having 300 million kroner to deal, to do, to work at Chalmers with gender equality. That's 24 million pounds. It's a lot of money. So <clears throat> now I've turned into a gender activist who has resources. That's much better than being a gender activist who doesn't have resources, I can tell you, because I meet a lot of those. <laughs> and I wrote the proposal together with various other female professors at Chalmers who I had not met before because we were officially discouraged from networking as females. It was considered a bad idea for females to network because that was making us too special and we shouldn't feel special. You know, we, okay. Now they've changed, their, they've changed their mind about such networking. But for example, I met with a bunch of uh, researchers when I was first writing the proposal uh, from civil engineering. And their attitude was, well, we, are, we have a lot of good ideas. Um, we can help Chalmers because look, this is a, a graph showing percentage of bachelor students, female, 46% in civil engineering. So when I, in my undergraduate class, there wasn't a single female <laughs> who did civil engineering. You know, this is, roads and water and cement and uh, dirt, and building things and being on building sites, 46% female students. It's amazing and brilliant. Now then they have a bit of a classic slide uh, as we go across you know, master's students, PhD students, assistant professors, associate professors, and so on. And then we have a strange thing at Chalmers called B thread and the professor, something between associate professor and full professor that only Chalmers retains, and they have some kind of blip there, which we need to investigate, okay? <clears throat> but generally, they have a slide downwards, uh, as do most departments, I would say. Here, interestingly enough, is our department, computer science and engineering, um, from 2017, the time we wrote the proposal. 12%, so it's not as bad as seven because we have more programs than just computer science and engineering. We have the IT program, which has more females. And then about 20%, you know, most of the way across, and then down. The 12% over there is, was two female full professors. And one of them left <laughs> just after this, right? But now we got one back, so we're back up to a bit below 12 because we got some more men as well. So. But we're very flat, right? And that means that if we want to make changes in the percentage of faculty, for example, at computer science, we need to do different things than you would need to do at, computer, at uh, uh, civil engineering. And once we had our 300 million kroner, we went around and talked to all the departments and tried to figure out you know, what, what is their current status. And they all have different looking graphs. And they all have heads of departments who do completely different things. Right, so it's not one Chalmers, it's 13 separate departments that form a university and they all have different problems. And so we, <coughs> we started by going around and talking to all the heads of department and finding out what is the current status and what we thought they should do next in order to make use of the resources we now have to help them increase gender equality. And we started to do that and, and last summer I thought, okay, I've got money, I've been talking to heads of department, maybe I better go and learn something about this topic. I'm a computer scientist, right? I, I don't know anything about gender equality, right? I've never done anything about it before. So I went to this conference 
um, called <coughs> the 10th European Conference on, higher, higher, uh, on Gender Equality in Higher Education. It was, in, it was at my alma mater, so that's the same company <laughs> that you saw earlier from Trinity. It was fantastic to go back to Trinity to a conference with 330 people, and two-thirds of them were women. It was really bizarre. I'm not, I've become so used to you know, this arrangement that it was really strange. <clears throat> and it was full of a lot of theoretical social scientists, mostly, who were not interested in figuring out how to change things, mostly. They were interested in observing things and, and figuring out how things are and, and writing about it. And then there were a few practitioners who were both interested in observing things and doing something about it. And I was trying to find them among this crowd of people, and I found some. There was a keynote. Most of the talks were incomprehensible, I have to say. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but there was a keynote by this guy. I'm good at one of my hidden talents is spotting uh, rising stars, I would say. I've, that, you know, this is a rising star in social sciences. He's, ca he's called Matthias Willem Nielsen. I don't pronounce it correctly. He's a Dane. And he gave a keynote about recruitment and about how the ways we do recruitment in our academic departments, he studies Aarhus University, um, is just terrible. It's just terrible from a gender point of view. We have a picture in our heads of a meritocracy that we think we are applying. And in reality, we do something completely different. And so the, he studied the numbers. He interviewed heads of department and so on. It was a fantastic and frightening keynote. So I'm going to try and get him to come to Shalmers. I haven't managed that yet. But I also, <coughs> I also met a gender studies professor who is interested in helping us. So she, she, I got her to join our advisory board. <coughs> there were, the first woman to graduate from Trinity um, in, in, in engineering science only did so in 1970. This is Jane Grimson. I graduated in 1980. It's only 10 years later. I had no idea at the time. Um, but she was at the conference. And she stood up and she said, I'm an engineer. I like to find problems, and then I like to solve them. <laughs> and, and I could see the whole audience thinking, oh, no. right? And, and I asked her for some good contacts, and she gave me a contact at Intel in Ireland, who's the head of the fab, the Intel fab in Ireland, who was graduated from Trinity in 1990. So I used the old girl network, ha ha, first time ever in my life, to get another uh, member for the advisory board. And she visited us a couple of weeks ago and gave us a fantastic talk about how they work at Intel, about increasing the percentage of tech staff. Um, so that was my first, uh, I, of course I read some other papers while I wrote the proposal and so on, but this was my first attempt to understand the field better. And then I have to start reading the real, more stuff, right? There's a famous book, some of you may have read it, called Why So Slow. I have to admit I had not read it. But luckily for us, <coughs> Valian, who was the author of that, has combined with Abigail Stewart to write a book called An Inclusive Academy. It's, I have it here. It's a big and depressing book, but it's brilliant because it the first half of it explains why we have a problem, some theories about why, why things are the way they are, and, and lots and lots of uh, relentlessly scholarly references to studies. This study shows that. This study shows this other thing. Reference, reference, reference. So you can't resist. I mean, uh, it's just so, com so convincing. And then the second half is what to do. So if you're in academia and you want to change something about gender equality in your uh, institution, buy this book. I bought a lot of them and I tried to give them away to heads of division in my department. I'm having trouble. Oh. One of the key ideas that Valian talks about is the notion of gender schemas, which I had not either heard of. Um, gender, I, I should add at this point that many of the, the links on my slides are clickable, so the slides are supposed to be a kind of useful resource later in the hope that you will go away and read some of the papers that I'm pointing to. Um, so this is a, a clickable short paper about gender schemas. What are they? They're unconscious cognitive biases that skew our perceptions and evaluations of men and women. 
causing us to overrate men and underrate women. And they affect our judgment of people's competence, ability, and personal characteristics. And this causes a small stream of everyday events, such, that, such as not listening when a woman talks, or not congratulating a woman on an achievement, or whatever. And Valiant's theory is that because of these gender schemas that are so inbuilt in both how women and men view women and men, then this adds up to small, but f a lot of small but frequent occurrences, which at, for each one seem too small, too petty, but which accumulate to advantage men and disadvantage women. And this is an interesting idea that we, I think we need to uh, take to heart and maybe examine. So, these are unconscious biases. This is not sexism. This is not overt sexism. And they're unconscious biases that we all hold, women and men. And there are lots of studies that uh, kind of point to the fact that these, these things happen. Typical of a study, I've kind of made a, an abstract version of a study. We, we, take, <clears throat> we take a lot of experts in a field. We show them two CVs. One of the CVs has an engineering degree and some fancy accreditation that took, say, four years and five years of experience. If we just put you know, neutral initials on the top, 75% of the experts will pick this CV, which has the extra education, and they will think to themselves, extra education is a good thing. <laughs> If we put Bob and Alice as the names, we will get the same result. Okay. If we put Alice and Bob, people will revise down their estimation of how important education is, and they will instead choose the other CV. And when interviewed you know, afterwards, this revision down, you know, they will change their view of what is good by being exposed to a, a woman's CV. Um, and this is frightening. Uh, it's frightening to know that these, these processes happen. Now you might think, oh, but they were just experts in some other field, it doesn't matter. Uh, we in academia, we're good at these things. We are not. Um, this is a paper from, from Nature in 1997. Um, it's called, it's a great title, <laughs> Nepotism and Sexism in Peer Review. So we have a Freedom of Information Act in Sweden. So these two researchers um, got all the review materials for uh, the assessment of applicants for postdoctoral fellowships in medicine one year. And they discovered that uh, women and men were just treated completely differently in the review process. If you were a woman, you needed to have had two and a half times as much research productivity to get the same score. They had some kind of impact score that they measured through journals and journal impact and so on. What did that mean in practice? You had to have had three more science and nat or nature papers than the men, or 20 more ordinary papers. So this is not minor, you know, minor things. This is huge differences. Um, and in addition, it turned out that even though there was some kind of conflict of interest thing, so that people could not review uh, scholars who were associated with their own institution. Other reviewers in the panel instead compensated for that and gave higher scores to the scholars who came from the, from the panel. So there was very measurable buddy-buddy uh, kind of behavior. This was front page news in ordinary newspapers in Sweden. I was in Sweden at that time, 1997. I remember the horror. In fact, the Medical Research Council resigned when the paper came out. There was something about trying to hide evidence in an attic. I mean, it was just uh, appalling. <clears throat> and the question, partly for me, is why did nothing happen? You know, I, and I think what I thought at the time was, ah, it's just the medical people. You know, we're all right. Uh, we know how to do it in computer science, uh, and I don't believe that at all anymore. Um, this is another example of a paper where 127 uh, faculty from research-intensive universities are shown CVs of a potential applicant for a laboratory manager position. So this is laboratory science. 
When they see the female CV, they rate it lower, they offer, low, they offer lower salaries, they, they decide on less mentoring and so on. So the, uh, these are identical CVs with different names on. So uh, general faculty in top universities are prone to this kind of behavior too. So we need to worry when we you know, interview master students to be doctoral students or whatever, that we might be behaving in these ways. Now you might think, <clears throat> okay, if these gender schemas and you know, unconscious bias are so terrible, why is it not the case that all fields are terrible? But all fields are not terrible. Some fields have lots of women in them. You know, uh, and so that's another thing that the social scientists have tried to study. You know, why are there a lot of women in chemistry and not a lot of women in computer science? And this is an interesting paper where they theorize that <coughs> uh, they ask people in the general public, how much innate talent do you think is needed to do various kinds of topics, research topics? Over here we have music theory and composition. That's the one where you're supposed to have the most amount of unique, uh, innate talent. So along that we have these uh, so-called field-specific ability beliefs. And along here we have percentage of 2011 American PhDs who are women. And, and where does computer science come? Kind of halfway along, but still with a very small percentage. So, you know, if, if it was to be along that line that they theorize about, computer science should have more, a higher percentage of, of PhD students. And in fact, you know, computer science is there. And engineering and physics, you know, our other two bad uh, topics are also kind of gathered around here, again at the, the, bottom, of the uh, bottom of the table. Um, and I think that uh, another thing that we need to question that has been a bit of a shock to me is the quality, the general quality of our meritocracy. So we, we as academics, we tend to think that we are very sure, we, we are sure of the accuracy of our ability to evaluate a grant proposal or a paper. And as we get older, we get more sure. Um, but there is in fact no correlation between our sureness and our accuracy. We are very bad at this. And this, this, this is a whole book studying uh, you know, the processes that go on in grant review panels, mostly in other topics than computer science. I, I would advise anybody who's writing grant proposals, particularly as a young uh, scholar, to, to read this. Um, and the, the this is the paper of the keynote that I talked about from the conference. Um, so this is where he studies uh, the reality of recruitment at Aarhus University compared to our, our abstract view of how you know, meritocratic uh, universities are. And I think here, um, Valian and Stuart nail it again. So there are two problems here. Uh, we argue that there is an important and unrecognized role for flawed error-prone cognitive processes in the many evaluations or judgments of merit that are at the center of our academic institutions. So that's us as individuals. But if these processes are indeed flawed in systematic ways, then the fact that our institutions are not strict meritocracies is the result not only of individual psychological processes, but of the institutionalized acceptance and solidification of these processes. So we can't only blame the individuals, we have to blame our departments, our hiring processes, and so on. Okay, so what have I told you so far? This is a bit of a break, so I can uh, get some water. Uh, I may have lost all my water. Oh. <laughs> There's water there, but not less. Uh, oh, okay. Um, so I've told you that two things are bad. One is that there are hardly any women, in, in either as students or as faculty, in computer science in particular. And the other is that uh, our meritocracy is broken. Uh, uh, you might want to read more stuff to believe me about that, but it's, uh, it's at least an interesting theory to have uh, as an academic. So some of you are from industry and some of you from academia, I guess, but why should we care? You might think to yourself, okay, I'll just go home and continue with functional programming and having fun, and I'm not gonna worry about this problem. Um, <clears throat> companies, I think, already know why it's a good idea to try to get more females into computer science and related disciplines. And that is that gender balanced teams 
in companies have been shown to work better. In fact, diverse teams in general have been shown to work better. There's lots of research about that. But the research about science is, is beginning to come in now. So it's much later and much less of it. But this is a kind of survey paper, again with the same name at the beginning, Matthias Willem Nielsen. And this is a kind of survey paper about what they know about um, the effects in particular of gender equality on quality of science. I'm just going to quote a, num a, a small number of the important uh, observations. <clears throat> One <coughs> is that women are more often are, are more often recognize expertise of fellow team members. They're less, apparently, less likely to be put off by uh, cues like, like gender or being fat or being a foreigner or whatever. Uh, here's an interesting one that kind of matches me at least. Women flourish in organizations with high degrees of cross-job com communication and non-hierarchical structures. That's interesting, particularly in a, in a period when our universities are being pushed into a higher level of managerialism and worse, I would say, hierarchical structures. But even if you have flat structures and you've made something that would appear to be good for the women, if you don't have a critical mass of some, somewhere between 15 and 30 percent, varying a bit between fields, it's not going to work anyway. So critical mass is an important idea that we need to take seriously. And if you, meet, if you reach critical mass, um, <clears throat> women then experience less stereotyping, more involvement in decision-making and team working, and higher levels of support. So there's very strong evidence for the value of having your minority, uh, which might be women or might be some, some other group, uh, reach a critical mass, which is often said to be, to be between 15 and 25 percent, in fact. But it's really important not to think, oh, well, we'll just, fee we'll just, you know, at Chalmers, now that we have 300 million kroner, we'll just hire lots of women, you know, and we'll leave everything else the same. And, and you know, we hope that, you know, we'll pour women in at one end and discovery and innovation and science will come out at the other end. And there's very strong evidence that that will not work. You have to change how things work. <clears throat> um, you have to have a critical mass. You have to, uh, you know, try to attain a critical mass, for example. You have to uh, uh, diversify possibly your research methods and so on. So just pouring women in at one end will not, you know, suddenly make everything better. Um, I think that's where many previous attempts have, have failed. In the, there have been a lot of previous attempts at universities, for example, to raise gender equality. Another reason to care, which I only discovered last week because I was at a, a workshop in Rome, <clears throat> where there was somebody from the, uh, the head of unit of digital, digital economy and skills at the European Commission gave a fantastic talk about how there are currently one million ICT vacancies in Europe and they expect two million by uh, 2030 and they are really worried that we in the universities are, not are simply not going to produce enough people with digital skills to run the economy. So her attitude was, okay, you're a bunch of academics trying to get more females into, uh, in, uh, and retain more females, you're part of my constituency because I'm relying on you to solve the problem and produce more ICT engineers at the end or, or ICT. So that's also important and actually it, it might also be important because there will be funding available from the EU for doing things to try to produce more ICT people. Uh, she, she, was very, she was also very worried, interestingly enough, about companies like Facebook and Google hoovering up professors. So she was very worried that, for a start, we're not producing enough people in computer science. And in addition, the professors are all going to go away and work for companies. So this was her big you know, fear. Um, it remains to be seen uh, what happens with that. So <clears throat> I became, I'm going to take a glass of water for a moment and leave you to think. Um, question is, what should we do? So at Chalmers, we managed to get money, so we have resources for a start. 
the leader, the project we call, we call Gender Initiative for Excellence, Genie, and it's led by Pernilla uh, Wittungsdorfsheder, who's a very good chemist. I work 30% for the project, and we have a head of department, in fact, the head of department of electrical engineering, surprise, surprise, who works 10% uh, for the project. I should point out, uh, especially after being at the workshop last week in Rome, we do many, before all this started, we did many quite good things at Chalmers already. We study the number gap, the, the pay gap, we, we keep track of numbers, we keep track of gender disaggregated data, as they say, for all kinds of things. And that's the first place to start. You won't be able to make any improvements in your gender equality if you don't know where you are, if you don't know what your status is. And what we've done <coughs> is that we have uh, declared to the world. So this is um, Svenska Dagbladet, which is like a big, very big newspaper, a normal, you know, every normal person kind of newspaper. And that's Pernilla and the president of the university. And it says, Chalmers, we're not, we are no longer going to be worst at gender equality. Okay. And this is um, the engineer, it's called. And this, there's the, rec the president again. And he says, uh, our goal is to get to 40% female full professors in 10 years, overall throughout Chalmers. And that is a very, very difficult goal. Uh, whenever he says this, or when I always add quietly, at every department, because it's very important not to just add women to architecture and chemistry and so on and, and fix it that way. Um, it's also important if one is uh, embarking on this to take overt harassment seriously and deal with that first. Uh, otherwise, nothing will happen. And we also need to feed the pipeline. So Simon's talk you know, uh, was, exact, was part of what we need in order to fix the problem of females in computer science because we first need to get the kids to study computer science at school before they can do it at university. Uh, Shalmers recently held a camp for, I think, two days. They brought uh, girls from all over Sweden. They stayed in a hotel, and they did various uh, experiments at Shalmers for, for two days. It's modeled on something they do at, uh, in Trondheim, where they get the 450 kids a year for three days. Girls, I mean. And uh, just doing this camp Vera once at Shalmers increased very substantially the applications to do computer science at Chalmers. So, and it increased applications also to a number of other programs, technical design and so on. What have we done with the money so far? <clears throat> I think this is the thing we're most proud of, and it wasn't in our proposal at all when we wrote the proposal. Um, <clears throat> Chalmers uh, recruits uh, assistant professors in a coordinated way every second year, 10 of them in the so-called areas of advance, which are uh, you know, cross-cutting topics like energy, transport, health, and so on. And they worked very hard. They searched for good applicants and so on. So just in the normal round, uh, they got, 12, I think, 1,200 applicants altogether for these positions. And seven of the winning, uh, the people who got jobs were women. So what we did in Genie was just go in and provide funding for five more of the, the women who came number two in these uh, uh, competitions. And then the department saw that this was maybe a good idea, and they added a few more, including one woman. So now there are 19 new assistant professors at Chalmers, 13 of whom are female. And this is going to be an important cohort for the future of the university, and we're going to try to make sure to look after them very well, uh, give them not only management training, but also training in how to run a research group and so on. We've also been around and talked to all the departments about different things that they can do. We have a kind of list of possible interventions. We've been helped a lot by Paul Walton at York, who has worked a lot with the Athena Swan initiative in the UK. But what we have to get across to the departments is that this is not, that we, we can't do the work. You know, we, we in the Genie team, we add up to 90% of a person altogether. And there are 13 departments with you know, 650 faculty. And if we are to change how the departments are, if we are to do things, if we are to search for good applicants, it's the, the faculty at the departments who have to do the work. So we have to persuade heads of department that they should provide funding, and perhaps some of it from us, to work with this topic. It's, it's a hard job. Um, it's hard to get everything started. <coughs> In recruitment, it's really important to listen 
to what the social scientists say. So Nielsen uh, gives very clear advice about how to improve uh, recruitment from a faculty perspective. Quality over quantity. Never recruit quickly for teaching needs. Uh, we've, you've probably seen it in your departments, teaching needs, teaching needs, we better recruit quickly. And, it, and there should be long-term planning, transparent planning of recruitment. And most importantly, perhaps, we need to be willing to examine and doubt our processes. The, the meritocracy that we thought we had was, was, was a fiction. And we need to worry about that. We need to worry about our processes. We need to take more seriously the input of external assessors when we have jobs and so on. We have a, we have a central uh, committee at Chalmers. And we're going to put gender bias observers in there trained by an expert, um, and they will, do th they will interrupt in a meeting and they will say, you've just spent 10 minutes talking about this man and, and five minutes talking about this woman, and you use these positive terms you know, for the man, and you used you know, aggressive for the women, you know, the way the, this gendered talk. And so they will try to uh, sidetrack some of these biases as they are going on. So we've been talking to the heads of the department and trying to persuade them to get started, but there's also a whole bunch of Keenies, mostly female, but not all, out you know, on the ground at Chalmers. So we made an open call for proposals. We're going to have put 15 million kroner into that. And what you had to do was make a proposal which combines science or education and gender equality. And we got, rather to our horror, 73 proposals. We were expecting maybe 30 or 40. So that we have now, we're in the middle of the process of evaluating those proposals. Uh, with the help of some of our advisory board and so on. Uh, 56 million kroner worth of proposals came in for the 15 million kroner budget. So um, this is good because it shows that there are people out on the ground trying to dream up useful things to do. But the crux of the whole matter, and this is where what makes it so hard, is culture change. So we need to change the way departments work. Um, the small day-to-day -day interactions, we have to get rid of the things that are perhaps call, causing uh, women to leave. You know, how do informal groups get formed? Who gets to join the large grant proposals? Do they get to join it just because they need a token woman or is it because they're competent or, and so on? Do people feel seen and appreciated? Are the processes clear, fair, published, transparent and so on? And how does communication work? This has been a real difficulty for us. Uh, uh, a technical university <laughs> seems to have difficulty with making communication work throughout the whole university. <clears throat> One way that I experimented with actually before Jeannie was to introduce a mindfulness course at the department, eight times one and a half hours, where we uh, both learned how to meditate, but also talked a lot about how we interact to each other. We talked a lot about the David Rock view of how the brain works and so on, how, uh, what happens. Um, and the effect of that, partly, partly of having groups from all over the department, not from individual divisions, sit together and meditate for 20 minutes and then talk for a while about how it is to be at the department, it brought up all kinds of questions, all kinds of issues about the culture. It kind of opened for discussion, and that was good. But it's also necessary to be patient. Um, and I, Pernilla and I have the greatest difficulty with this. We started in January this year, and we're a bit inclined to the, you know, well, we wish something would happen, but it's, it's going to take 10 or 20 years to get anywhere. <clears throat> it does improve. So these are, um, this is the graph for York chemistry, uh, the, the chemistry department at York. Uh, and this is after 20 years of work. Uh, they started with zero, um, where, where are we, uh, faculty. They started with zero uh, percent. Uh, faculty when, they, when they, they did this, and now they're at 40 percent. Um, they're still a bit, they still have some work to do over at the professor side, but generally they have improved and they have increased. In Britain you have this uh, research assessment thing and they have improved the quality of their research over that time. So they have uh, increased the number of women and they have improved uh, the quality of their research. Now, the, the kind of thing that we're trying to do at Chalmers, which is to put resources into gender equality has created resistance. Um, this says, you know, can you imagine a small university spending 30 million US dollars merely to be gender certified? In Sweden, this has now become a horrible reality. And worse still, um, this has 408 likes. 
This is a tweet with 408 likes. There's an even more interesting uh, headline here. I have not managed, I don't, it's behind a paywall, but it says, somebody wrote a debate article which says, the feminization of Chalmers is good for China. <laughs> I don't even know what it means, right? But uh, so there is resistance, uh, mostly outside Chalmers. For future work, we're going to um, have visiting professors get, just get more women onto the ground to act as role models for doctoral students and for undergraduates. Um, data analysis, analysis is absolutely central. So we've hired two uh, data analysts part, part of their time. But I also think that we need help from industry. So for a start, this is so soul-destroying or tiring work. Right? So you, you, you go into your university, you go to, say, the physics department, and you try to persuade them to do something, and they just look at you as, the, as though you were mad. You know, and, and they will have a discussion forum where they say, we have two female f physics professors. We don't need any more. You know, we're, we're very good. So, I mean, it, so we, need, we need encouragement from you who are in industry. What might you do, whether you're from industry or academia, one thing is to just try to be observant in your own judgments about when you're hiring or when you're you know, judging grant proposals or whatever. Uncon unconscious bias really does affect our decisions and small things add up. Be creative when recruiting. Um, the, the workshop I was at last week, we were talking about that we need, we need to get more females into the faculty and there was some dean there who said, but that means I have to persuade my staff to hire people who are not excellent. And I think to myself, okay, this is somebody who believes that we are a meritocracy and hasn't really read the literature, hasn't really, and that's the wrong way to go. Okay. My way of being uh, creative was to hire, not a functional programmer, but a machine learning expert, a female machine learning expert who happens to like, you know, she's gonna learn functional programming very quickly. Um, and you might do what, like Joe Morris did for me when I was uh, an undergraduate, encourage a bachelor student, um, change a life. It, it doesn't matter if it's a woman or a man. I mean, get more people into computer science by uh, doing this. Most of you will probably have either taken a degree at a university or are thinking of taking a degree at a university. Push your former or nearest university to take action. So what we found at Chalmers is that the doors were open when we wrote the proposal. So, in fact, Chalmers had a list of 10 risks with gender equality at number one, uh, which to be managed by the, the head of, by the president. I didn't as faculty know that. No faculty seemed to have known that. But it meant that when we wrote the proposal, it was clear that it would get funded. So, you know, go to your university and ask them, what are they doing? Uh, you know, what are you doing to get more women into computer science? Because, um, Changing a university, this is a great quote by uh, somebody called Jeffrey Bolton, who I have since I last gave this talk discovered has an honorary doctorate from Chalmers, so I'm going to get him to come to Chalmers and give, you know, roughly this talk. <coughs> Changing university is like moving a graveyard. You will not get no help from the people inside. I mean, it's just too close to the bone to be... Uh, uh, so we need help. Um, you who are in industry a little higher up, perhaps, Join, go, go and influence. You know, our department, for example, has an advisory board which has industry people in it, very good industry people. You know, some of you could go there and ask, you know, is gender equality on your agenda at all? Because in some departments it's not. When you start collaborations, you know, place some demands. Refuse to work with all male teams. I mean, do something. <laughs> That's what I'm asking here. Sponsor a female master's student. You know, help out of one of those Camp Vera recruitment camps or just adopt a school that, uh, you know, like Simon said. Um, but what I guess the, the, what I want to say here is that Simon said schools need help. Uh, what I'm saying here is universities need help. <laughs> and there, you know, there may be not so many of them, so maybe we can, you know, uh, you can actually help. <clears throat> and the other thing I guess you need to do is listen to the women in your, at your own place. So there was a meeting last week at Chalmers, which I didn't know about until afterwards, because when I read about it in the newspaper, of tech women, called uh, Women in Tech, and they wrote a demands list, which I think is quite interesting, to their employers. The first one is, 
end the harassment. We want power, not dick pics. I think it's a very good first demand, right? <laughs> M many of them had, uh, you know, sub demands. Uh, the second demand asks for very reasonable things like reverse mentorship. You know, have junior workers mentor senior work workers with the help, you know, aiming to help the seniors rather than the juniors. Um, take human bias out of decisions and so on. Equal pay. Need we say more? Okay. And we need to change the culture in many places, both in academia and in industry. And it's not a women's issue. So we held a genie lunch last week, 35 people came, three men. This is depressing. You know, it's not a women's issue, it's, a, it's an issue for everybody. So we need to kind of spread the idea that this is a problem for all of us. And I've begun, after all this reading, I've seen a pattern in these attempts to do gender equality work. You know, the early ones talked about fixing the women, the next ones talked about fixing the numbers, our first attempts, we talked about excellence. We had, we had kind of not noticed that excellence maybe is not such a great thing to build a, ho a whole uh, uh, change upon. And so what I've really understood now, after all this reading and talking to people, is that if we're going to solve this problem and get more females you know, working as faculty in computer science and STEM subjects, we need to build working environments that work for everybody. It's not about the women, it, it's about the fact that our working environments just don't work and we need to be willing to change them. And that kind of leads me to the you know, slightly unhappy idea that we as faculty and as people from industry maybe need to join the debate about what are the universities for. So this is a, a paper by the same Jeffrey Bolton asking the question, what are universities for? And it might be that if we are going to achieve the kind of change we would like to and make our universities be places where everybody thrives, then we need to change very much how they are. And we need to perhaps push back against some of the pressures that universities are feeling currently. So uh, that's all I have to say. Um, the next slide is about, you know, I, I, we could do with help. Uh, and I think, you know, universities in your own countries could do with help too. Um, so please, over beer, uh, tell me how you think you might be able to help, um, suggestions and ideas. But also right now, uh, if I'm allowed, we could have maybe one quick question. No? Okay, let's go for beer and uh, you can ask me questions.